let's say it more, more, more simply, don't mobilize in time, don't deploy in time, and don't attack first. To achieve these objectives, the planner has to narrow Israeli early warning space and reduce its relevance. Now, when I, I, when I, I use the term early warning space, I mean the span of time required to raise the alarm, to make decisions, and to complete the counter steps, uh, which is a process that involves intelligence, decision makers, and operational elements all alike. Narrowing the Israeli early warning space would allow the Egyptians to pass through what they perceive to be the most critical phase of their operation, by shortening the time span between the moment the Israelis would be convinced of the war and the moment the Egyptian army completed establishing bridgeheads on, on, on uh, uh, the, the eastern side of the canal to an extent that it would make any IDF response actually irrelevant. Now, lately in a TV show, a former Egyptian director of military intelligence stated that the official title for the deception plan had been, he said in Arabic, that's mean a plan for strategic deception. And indeed, the deception was strategic in nature, aimed at the national decision maker uh, with a crystal clear deceptive message. The Egyptian has no intention of going to war in the near future. Although the Egyptian also took advantage of tactical deception, uh, tactical deception means at their disposal, these were employed exclusively to support the strategic goal and transmit identical message. Thus, for example, the situation was portrayed as business as usual in every level possible, starting, for example, uh, with Sadat tranquil policy declarations, continuous with diplomatic moves abroad, and ending with groups of half-naked soldiers leisurely passing their time fishing along the Suez Canal. <laughs> <laughs> Intoxicated by the power syndrome that the Israeli society experienced at that time, uh, I think that the decision maker, general and intelligence alike, were bonded by a belief that even if the Arab uh, uh, overestimated their power and launched war, they would be beaten very easily in the battle. This mindset is the key to understand why the deceptive message was absorbed in the Israeli perception lock, stock, and bear over what turned out to be the critical period for, for, for both protagonists. The one conclusion shared by all students of deception surprise is that the more the deception a story fits the victim's perception and beliefs, the easier it will be for the story to be swallowed and acted upon. The Egyptian message fits the Israeli mental beliefs and land assessment like a glove, either by intention or by accident. All the information reaching the DMI at the time was interpreted according to the concept, even if they required, what they say, force adjustment uh, fed by a set of cognitive biases and heuristic judgment. In theory, the Israeli early warning system was molded precisely to detect such Arab attempts. Arab attempts at surprise, based on ringing the bell, the instant it detected changes in the actual capabilities and preparedness of, of enemy forces. Regardless the assessment about their motives or intention, but the reality was that assessing capability was pushed aside and not for the first time for assessing enemy intention and decision. This dictated the tune of the intelligence orchestra and entirely dominated Israeli mindset. By placing the Tahrir exercise on the fallacious basis layer, namely the Egyptian willingness to continue the political process, and that is enemy intention, focuses on enemy intentions, and offering the exercise as the explanation for any regular capability phenomena, the Egyptian managed to deactivate Israel's capacity to realize the significance of, of signals of warning, which comes quite, quite a lot of them, that under no circumstances could be concealed anymore. They thus coaxed the victim into adopting tranquilizing interpretation that was completely swallowed as it so beautifully fit the basic perception.